We begin today the Gemara on Dafa and Gimel on Adalif, where it says, Boy Rami Bachama. This is sort of a continuation from the Gemara before, which was discussing the Lashon that the Pasik says regarding the power of a husband to nullify his wife's Nadarim. Vishoma Isha, that the husband heard, her husband heard about the Nadarim. And then what happens? So if he's quiet, so that means he validated it. If he not, if then he has the power to nullify it. But it all says Vishoma Isha, that the husband heard about this. So the Gemara before asked the question, does that mean that he actually has to hear about it or you could nullify a daughter even without hearing about it? So here, the Gemara will be following the approach that the husband does not have to hear about it. And yet still, the Gemara has another question based on that. This is again Rami Bachama. Before it was Rami Bachama that was discussing this. And again, Rami Bachama asked another question based on what he said before. So boy, Rami Bachama, Rami Bachama asks the following Shaila. Cheresh, a person that's deaf. Usually in Gemara, when it speaks about a Cheresh, it's a Eina Medaba Veina Shemeya. And that's an individual that's considered to be Eina Bardas. He's, he, has, he's not, he has like no, no understanding of anything. But over here, we're talking about a husband that will have the ability to nullify his wife's Nadarim. So we can't be speaking about a such, such a person. But rather the Cheresh here is a person that's deaf, but he can talk. So he's considered to be fully sane human being. But he can't hear the Nadarim that his wife makes. So Mao Shiyafal Ishtai. What's the halacha? Is he able to nullify the nadarim of his wife? What's the basis of the question? If you're going to say regarding the previous Shiloh that was asked, that Baal may for below that a husband is able to nullify his wife's nadarim even without hearing the nadarim that she made. But what I could say, maybe the reason is Mishum the Bar Mishmahu, because he's an individual that has the capacity to hear those nadarim. He has the ability. So even if he didn't actually hear, the very fact that he potentially could hear, that's good enough. A cheresh, a person deaf, can't hear. Impossible for him to hear any daughter his wife would make. So then, maybe he can't nullify the nadarim. Now, where do you see this idea that the fact that you have a potential to hear the nadarim, that that matters? If in actuality, you didn't hear the nadarim, who cares that you could potentially hear them? Why is that significant? So the Gemara brings a source, this is brought a lot of times in Shas, that we find regarding uh, the halachas of a carbon minchet. So hi, hi, Rab this is connected to a famous thing that Rab Zayde said. Oh, my Rab Zayde, Rab Zayde says, Kol aroi libilo. So when it comes to a carbon mincha, the Torah says, you take the flour, you take the oil, it has to be placed into a bowl and it has to be mixed together. And the Torah says a few times that it must be mixed. So what Rab Zayde says, how about if you have too much in a bowl and it can't be mixed? If it'll be mixed, it'll fall out of the bowl. So if, if the amount that you have is roi libila, if you have in the bowl en- enough, but it's not too much, but it's, it's, so it's still fit that it could be mixed, ain't bila makevis, but to actually mix it is, does not prevent this carbon mincha to be done properly. If it's so much in the bowl, so much flour, so much oil, and therefore it's impossible to mix it, so then, because it's impossible to mix it, now, when the Torah says that it has to be mixed, will be necessary. Right? So the, the, this is brought regarding the, the shear for this is 60 isodin. The bowl can handle only 60 isodin of flour and the, the oil. So if you have up to that amount, so then it could be mixed. So you don't have to actually mix it. But if you have 61, so it's going to be impossible to be mixed, it's going to spill over, so then you're going to have to place it into two separate bowls. So what do you see over here? When the Torah writes this requirement of mixing it, when does that requ- requirement apply to actually have to do it only if it's impossible? To, to, uh, if, if there's no potential for it to be mixed, so then that means you're not fulfilling what the Torah said. But if you have the potential to mix it, you don't have to actually mix it. Just the fact that it potentially could be mixed fulfills what the Torah said. So we could say the same thing over here. The fact that he could potentially hear what, it, what his wife is saying. So then, even if he doesn't hear, he could nullify an Adonim. But if he's deaf, he can't hear. So then you can't say, Vishom Aisha. The Torah meant at least he should have the potential to hear. Or perhaps we could say, Vishom Aisha, what is, when the Torah writes the words, Vishom Aisha, that her husband heard, Laimakif. That's not something that's necessary at all. The Torah just used this term, Vishama Isha, just telling you usually how it happens. Usually a husband hears and then he nullifies. He doesn't have to nullify before he knows there's any Nidana. But it's not Ma'akif Bakhlaw. The husband could nullify the Nidana without hearing anything. Omar Sarav answers this question and he brings a clear Braise. Toshima. 
Come and hear what it says here. Vishama Isha. The Braisa brings this Pasik Vishama Isha and it says, Beprat Laishas Khadesh. This Pasik is excluding the wife of a Khadesh. The husband will not be able to nullify the daughter. Shmami, no, this is a clear proof that if he's a Khadesh, if he's deaf, he can't nullify the Nadara. Ibayalahu, another Shaila was asked. Baal, a husband, he's married to two wives and they both made Nidarim at the same time or on the same day. Can he nullify the Nidarim of both of his wives at the same time? He tells both of them the Nidarim that you both made are nullified. Together. Same Nidarim or two different Nidarim? It could be the same, could be different. I don't think it makes any difference. Well, he just, because he doesn't have to, when he nullifies the nether, he doesn't have to spell out the content of the nether. He just tells both of them, the nedarim that you both made. I mean, I'm looking at the Lashon of the Ran, he says, mufr He says to them in a plural Lashon that the nedarim that you both made is nullified. So what's the Shiloh based on? If you look into the Lashon of the Pasik, Vishama Isha, so over there it says, further on the Pasik says, Oisa. Okay, the full of the Pasuk over there by Isa, it says, Yem Shmai Isha, and then it says, second, Yoni Isa. Yoni Isa means he can nullify her nether. So it uses a singular term. So therefore it's one, one at a time. I love Dafke. Or the Taita is using the expression of Isa, but it doesn't exclude if you have two wives. It's just saying, generally, Isa goes on her or on the nether? Isa, the, the nether. Yoni Isa. Well, even if it goes on the nether, but it uh, means only one nether though, it's still a singular term. So is it Taita Lav Dafke? You could say that the Taita used this term because that's what's normal, that he's made for one nether. But if there's two, it could be made for both at the same time. If one, if one uh, Isha one makes two nether, yeah. you could have a similar question. Maybe, yeah. maybe, Anachanami, maybe. Amar Avine, sort of in answers, and he brings you from the Allah by Asaita. Toshima. What does it say in the Mishnah by Asaita? Ein mashkin shtei saitis kachas. By Asaita, a woman where there's, she's suspected of having a relation with someone else and she's obligated to drink the waters of Asaita to determine whether she did or didn't. So if a person has two wives and he's suspecting both of them, so he can't give both of them to drink of the waters of the Saita and the Azar of the Beis Mikdash together. What's the reason? So the Tanakhamir here says, Mipnei shaliba gas bechaverta, because if, each, if they're both coming together and they're comfortable with each other, they're not going to admit for, to what they did. Before they drink the waters of the Saita, we try to convince them to admit. If they, did, if they did anything wrong, they should admit. But if they're coming together, each one will look at the other one and feel encouraged to, to stand strong and not admit. So we don't want them to come together. Rabbi Yudayme, Rabbi Yudu says, This is not the reason. You don't have to have this explanation because they support each other being there together. Elot is it's based on a pasik. Mishum Shanema, the Taita says, Vihishka Oisa, that he should give her to drink. It uses the term Oisa, referring only to one of them. So therefore I say Levada, that she has to be alone, not together with another or with another uh, wife. So according to Rabbi Yehuda, the Gemara is saying the same thing applies over here regarding two wives that make the nether because the Pasuk uses the Lashon Oisa, it means you could only nullify one nether of one wife at a time, not two together. So we can learn it out from the Saita. Okay. Zaktelige Mishneh. This was quoted already partially before. Here, there's again. Why are the two of them being together? They want to chuga. That's That was the Tanakama, correct. As a swara, they won't put the chuga, yeah. Okay, so this Mishneh here discusses the halachas again of the husband having the ability to nullify his wife's nadarim while she's in Arusa. So usually that's only together <coughs> with the father. But over here, this Mishnah says that after a certain time period, the husband could nullify the nadarim alone without the husband. When is that? Baigeres. If she is a Baigeres, she's already older, she's 12 and a half. So now, at this point, the father cannot be made for the Nidarim. The father's power over his daughter is only at the age of a Naira. Mm. Or, 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 we learned this before, even though it says it in the Mishnah as one continuation, Sheshasa, it sounds like it's one case, talking about the Baigeres, but it's a separate case. Sheshasa Yud Beis Chaydish, or the case of any wife, which is not a begetis, she's under the age of 12 and a half. And again, we're talking here about a girl that's in the stage of Edison, after the first stage of marriage. But now, after Edison, 12 months already passed. Okay, so we, I don't know if you remember, we learned this in the Gemara before, regarding the begetis, she's not given full 12 months to prepare for her wedding. How much time is she given? 12 months from the day she became a begetis. So whatever age she got married, uh, the first stage of marriage, 
could be she was already six months of begetas, so she'll, so she'll only have six months to prepare for a chasana. Right? So therefore, begetas means also, when the Mishnah says begetas, it means the begetas that was married, the first stage of marriage, and the time set for when the full chasana should take place, when the full marriage should take place, arrived already. Or, or the next case, again, similar idea, that the eight is sin, and then 12 months passed, and the husband didn't marry her, for whatever reason. Or the third example, the almana. When a person marries an almana, so over here, she's only given 30 days to prepare for the chasana. So lamed yayim, those 30 days passed. So Rabbi Yeza, Rabbi Yeza says, Hoyol, Bailo, Chayev, Mbuzenisel. Since after 30 days by the almana, or after 12 months by, the, by a regular girl, by a naira, or by a begetis, whatever time there is, so the time of the marriage has arrived, and now the husband is obligated to feed her. Even though seemingly she's still living in the father's house, but the husband's obligated to feed her, Yofer. So therefore, the halach here will apply that the husband is like he's fully married to her, and therefore he alone is made for the nadarim, without the father. He has the power to nullify his nadarim alone, her nadarim alone. The Chachamim Ma'imrim, however, the Chachamim disagree. Ain't a Baal Mefer, Achetekonis Lodeshusa. The husband cannot be Mefer, these Nedarim himself, until she actually fully marries him. The fact that the time of marriage arrives and he has to feed her at that point, that does not change the halacha over here, Minat regarding this halacha of Hafadis Nedarim. And therefore, only when he's fully married to her will he be able to be Mefer, those Nedarim alone. So to Gemara, to explain now the opinion of Rabbi Yezer, that this is connected to something else. And here the Gemara brings a Gemara in Ksubis that discusses this, we learned this. Omar Rabbe, so Rabbe explained, Rabbi Yezer. When Rabbi Yezer here says that if the time of marriage arrived and he didn't marry her yet, so from that time he could be Mayfair and Adarim, Um Mishnah Rishayna. And the halacha that was taught in the Mishnah in the beginning, so as we'll see, there was a Mishnah Rishayna, and then there was the later Chachamim that changed the Psaq. So the halacha of the original Psaq, the way it was, Amru Dabar Echa. They're really saying one and the same point. Now what is this original Psaq of the Mishnah Rishayna? So we learned in the Mishnah, We give a Basula when after the first stage of marriage, 12 months, Lefarnas Atzma. To prepare herself, to prepare whatever she needs for the chasana. If the 12 months are up and he did not marry her, so So first of all, now he's the one that has to feed her. And also another halacha here, and this is what's relevant for what we're going to be speaking about regarding truma. If the husband is a kayin, so then she's able to eat truma as if she's already fully married to him. What's the halacha of truma? So really, by, by, by truma, you learn out from a posik, Kenyan Kaspai. That because she, when she gets married, she's considered to be king and Kaspar, that her, the husband acquired her, so therefore she could eat truma like her husband the Kayan. But Chachamim will geyser that in the first stage of marriage, even though she's already king and Kaspar, but nevertheless <coughs> she can't eat truma. If you remember, we learned about this in Ksubis, there are two reasons for this. Either because the husband may discover some kind of blemish she has and he won't be interested in marrying her. So it turns out that uh, she's really the whole marriage was a mistake. He finds some kind of a blemish that shows that it wasn't a marriage at all. That's one reason. Another reason is in the stage of the, the, the first stage of marriage when she's still living in her father's house, if she gets truma from her husband, the Kayin, she may then share that truma with her brothers, sisters, and the family. So therefore we don't want to give her this truma. But the mission here says after the 12 months are up, so now she can eat truma. Aye, why aren't we concerned about these things that Chachamu were concerned about? So the Gemara there explains, after 12 months, the husband already had enough time to interrogate the matter, and he knows that she has no blemish, and he's not going to go back on the marriage. And also, the Gemara there says another point, that really, after 12 months, even though she didn't get married yet, if the husband's feeding her, she moves into a different apartment, she lives herself, she doesn't live together with her family. So therefore, she eats truma. That's a simple pshat of the Mishnah there. Avol, now this, is, this next point is not really so relevant to our Gemara, but the Mishnah there continues and explains that this does not apply for a woman that's waiting to get married to a Yavam. Avol Yavam, but when it comes to the halacha of her waiting to get married to a Yavam. So she, her husband died without any children, she has to get married to the brother, and she's waiting to get married to him, mm-hmm. even if the time of marriage that was set arrived. So the fact that this Yavam is a Kayin will not be enough that she should be allowed to eat Truma. And the Gemara there learns it out from a Pasik. Uh, the Yavam is not called Kenyan Kaspoy at this point. It's, it's, uh, so therefore, even when I tell you, she doesn't need any truma. And the Brahis is spelled, sorry, the Mishnah there spells out details to this. Also, Shisha Chadoshim Bifnei Abal. She waited six months in the, in the lifetime of her first husband to get married to him. 
and then the shisha chadashim b'fnei yavam, and then the husband died, and now she waited another six months for the yavam to get married to him. So now in total, she already waited twelve months. So the time of her marriage that was set arrived. Or kulam b'fnei abal chaser yom echad, or even if she waited twelve months minus one day in front of the when her husband was still alive, and then her husband died right before the right before the day of the chasana. So then now she has just waits one more day and the time set is already here and she's waiting not to get married to her Yavam. Or she waited all this time for, in, the, in the life of the Yavam besides one day that was in the life of the husband. She does not eat Trume from the Yavam which is a Kayin. Zu Mishneh Now the Mishnah says this is all the way the Halacha was passed in the beginning. And the, the, the point over here of this Pesach is that the time of the marriage set arrives, she can eat Trume from her husband, the Kayin. Bezn Shalach Reim Mamru, however, the later Chachamim, the later Bezn came and argued, and they said, A woman, after the first stage of marriage, even though the time set for marriage arrived, and the husband now has the obligation to feed her, but nevertheless, she cannot eat from his Trume until she's actually fully married, which is Chope. Okay, so now what's the Gemara trying to say over here? That Rabbi Yezer, that, that says that when the time of marriage set arrives, now the husband could be made for the Nedarim alone, this halacha of Rabbi Yezer, regarding this halacha of Afaris Nedarim, which is Minat Teire, is really the basis, is really connected to the Mishnah Rishayna, the halacha that it says over there, that she can eat from the Truma of her husband, the Kayin. All right, so the Ran explains what the Gemara is thinking at this point is as follows. When you look in the simple Pshat and the Gemara there in Ksubis, it seems like the, the argument between the Mishnah Rishayna and the later Chachamim is regarding those concerns that I mentioned before, whether, whether he may find a blemish or whether she may share the Truma with someone else. So the, the Mishnah Rishayna was not concerned about that once the time of marriage arrived. But the later Chachamim said, we still have to be concerned. Even after the time set for marriage arrives, it's possible that he'll still find the blemish and it'll turn out that it wasn't a marriage. Or it's possible that she'll still share from the Truma with her siblings. That's a simple shot of that Mishnah. But what Rabbah is suggesting to say over here is that really the basis of the Mishnah Rishayna to say that when the time of marriage arrives, she can eat from this Truma is connected to this Halacha of Afaris Nadarim and Atayra. If not for the fact that I find Minatayra that she's like fully married and the husband could be made for an Adarim, Chachamim would not be makel regarding their Takana that she can't eat Truma from her husband the Kain until she gets married. Because it's Xayda, Chachamim were guys and they made their Xayda very strong. Because Rabbi Yezza said that we find regarding the Halachim and Atayra that she's considered to be to some extent married. Regarding what? Regarding Afaras Nadarim. Therefore, that was the basis of what the Missionary Shaina said that. The, uh, the, that she can eat truma from her husband, the Kayin. That's the way Rabbi understands this. But the Gemara asks on this, Amalei Abaye, so Abaye says to Rabbi, not necessarily are they connected. Dilma, Lohi, maybe the opinion of Rabbi Yezi here regarding the Nedarim Menatayra and regarding the halacha of eating truma there, which is all just with Rabbanon, that she's not allowed to eat that truma. So it's not connected because Atkan, Lohi, Ko, Ashmi'inon, Mishneri, Shaina. When I hear over there the halacha of the missionary Shaina that says that when the time set for marriage arrives that she's allowed to eat the truma, so that's el lamecho betruma de rabbanon. Over there, what it's saying is, since really minatayra, she's allowed to eat from that truma the moment she gets married, the first stage of marriage. She's called kinyin kaspai. So the whole thing that's stopping her of eating the truma until she's fully married is just midrabbanon. So over there, I could say, when the time set for marriage arrives, so chachamim say the shashes, the concerns we have are not so strong anymore, and we allow her to eat the truma. So that's all when you're dealing with a question of exayim midrabbanon. Havel nedarim dayraise. Here, the halacha of nedarim, which is halacha min atayra, we're dealing with the power of the husband that he should be able to be made with the nedarim alone without the father. And over here, that halacha min atayra only applies once he's fully married to her. Amalai? I would say not. Maybe over here, that's only after he's taka really fully married to her. Otherwise, he has to participate with the father to be made with the nedarim. That's one way we could explain the difference between our case and the case over there. Now, Abai actually says, if you want, you could explain the difference, the opposite. In the reverse. If you want, I can tell you. When did Rabbi say that the husband has the power to be made for his wife's Nidarim alone? That's only over here by Nidarim. Dafke by Nidarim, I say that when the time of marriage arrives, that it's for Nidarim, it makes sense to say that it's like he's fully married and he could be made for the Nidarim without the father. Why is that? 
Okay, the Rav Pinchas Mishmei the Rava, because there's a certain Svara that Rav Pinchas said in the name of Rava to explain why it is that a father could be made for his wife's Nadarim. Why, why, why does a, again, did I say father? I don't mean the father, the husband. What, what's, the, what's the rights, what's the control that we say that a, a husband has over his wife's Nadarim? This shows some kind of a control that a husband has. It's not, it's not a matter of control, but really he said the reason is the Oma, Kola Nadaris al Das Bailahi Nadaris. It's really because when she made these nadarim, she, we know, we assume that she only made these nadarim thinking that her husband will agree to them. She made it uh, with the understanding that probably her husband will accept it. If it turns out her husband does not accept it, so that's, that is the reason why the husband has the rights to nullify the wife's nadarim. That's the svara. So therefore we could say that the svar over here is that this wife, even though she's not fully married yet, but when the, when the time of marriage was set, arrived, and now the husband is the one that's feeding her, and usually she already moves out of her father's house, even if she's not yet fully living with her husband, but nevertheless she already moved out of his father's house, and the husband is feeding her. So this svar of Rav Pinchas already applies, that when she makes the nadarim, she's probably making it thinking that I, that I hope my husband will agree to what I'm saying. So therefore, he can be made for nadarim at that point. Ah, well, Troma, on the other hand, when it comes to Troma, I fill him with the Rabbanon. Even though the fact that she can't eat Troma before, before she's fully married is only a Gzairim with the Rabbanon, Nami Achla. But maybe if she's not fully married, she can't eat that Troma because there are the concerns we have that maybe you'll find a blemish on her, maybe she'll share with her brothers, maybe those things still apply. So that's the conclusion. That's why you can't compare these two things. There's an interesting Rane, just to finish off on this Gemara. The Rane says that some say that based on this Svara that Rav Pinchas says over here, you may think that you could apply this to all in the Any Anytime you make a nether, if you in your mind are thinking that I'm only making this nether, let's say a person's with a roommate, and he makes the nether only on Manas that my roommate agrees. So now the roommate has the power to nullify the nadarim. Because Rav Pinchas is saying that the whole point of why a husband could nullify the wife's nadarim is because she makes the nether with the daft that the husband will agree. Do I say that between any two people? So the Ran says, some Rishonim say so, but the Ran uses the Lashon here, that he says it's a shigiga seira, it's, it's a mistake. He says that, uh, of course Rav Pinchas agrees that the idea that a husband could nullify his wife's nadarim is a special power the Torah gave to the husband. It's exeris akasav, it's not just a swara that you say between any two people. Elamai is explaining that the logic behind this power that the Torah gave the husband is based on this idea that the wife naturally makes the nadarim wanting her wife's, wanting the husband's consent to this. So therefore we say that that halacha minatayda, that zeris akasav already applies once the husband is feeding her and taking care of her, that probably she's making the nadarim with that intention. But we don't apply this regarding any two people. This only applies in this zeris akasav between a husband and a wife.